Welcome to On Texas Football. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers and C.J. Vogel. Uh, we're going to kind of continue the discussion we had uh, talking about the offensive depth chart uh, and carry it over into the defense now. Uh, there were a couple of surprises on offense, I thought, from, from guys, particularly the discussion over the wide receiver uh, room and tight end even, I thought was interesting. But let's let's start the defense and give, again, we're going to give ground rules or parameters, whatever you want to say. Uh, Rod suggested this, and I agree. Texas operates the most out of the, the base nickel package, which is essentially a 4-2-5 look or a 2-4-5, whatever, uh, whatever Pete Kwiatkowski wants to call it. But essentially, it's five DBs. Uh, so that's what we're going to do for today and, and go with that. Rod, I want to start with you, if you don't mind, and start mm -hmm. around the edges, the buck and the jack position. Last year, Ethan Burke was the buck. Uh, Baron Sorrell, the Jack, they both return this year, but you also have the addition of Trey Moore. You know that Justice Finkley played a lot. What are, you, what are your thoughts on uh, the predicted starting lineup as we head into to, to spring camp in this uh, training period? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really interesting. I, I don't see how you, you keep Trey Moore off the field considering right. what he's coming in and what he's accomplished uh, the question is, with both those guys returning, who do you take off the field? I, I happen to see him as your, you know, he's going to be your best pass rushing edge player, honestly, in terms of making splash plays that you've had since Sark has been here. Uh, so I'll say Trey Moore is at one end. I'll go with, ooh, that's good. If Trey Moore is going to be in, he'll probably end up being uh, maybe your, maybe the buck. Is that probably where they'll put him at? I'm not sure exactly they, how they, they, recruited him. Him. they recruited him as a buck. That's what I, I mean. That's exactly. So if that's the case, then I, I you know, in the, if you're going Jack and Buck, then I'll go with Trey Moore at the other Jack. Then I'll, I guess Baron, Baron Sorrell is your other Jack coming back. Uh, so I would project that those are your two defensive ends. I don't want to take Ethan Burke off the field, but I don't say how I, I don't see how Trey Moore is not one of those guys, unless you want to move Ethan Burke to the Jack. And then you're talking about taking Baron Sorrell off the field. I, I tell you what, um, we talked about it in the other one, first world problems. The reality of it is, is they got to get after the quarterback better than they have in the, in the past. Agreed. Whether that means uh, inserting Trey Moore because he's had some success doing that or figuring out who's better to do it between uh, Ethan Burke and Baron Sorrell. Uh, both of those guys made plays obviously this year. CJ, how do you, how do you uh, figure into this? What are, you, what are your thoughts? I, I was thinking in a perfect world, you move Ethan Burke to Buck. You know, you use him on that strong side. I think that the length and the size plays to your advantage there. That also frees up Trey Moore to go into that jack role where you can let him loose, you know. And I, I think that would help. At least the two of them in my eyes are the two best pass rushers that you're going to have on, on roster next year. Uh, that's not to say that Baron Sorrell won't take a jump, but I'm looking at the numbers now. I mean, Burke had about a sack and a half more than Sorrell in, you know, uh, on almost 30% less of the snaps on the field. So I thought there's a little bit more disruption there. How does Colin Simmons fit into this? I'd like to see him on the field. We haven't talked about him yet, but if he's able to, and we've talked about it on, on Coffee and Football, you know, three or four sacks for Simmons in a rotational role, I would say he's a good freshman campaign. Anything more than that, you're playing with uh, house money. And especially here's when you're – Here's my take on it, guys. I think that us – debating who's going to start is almost unnecessary because I think it's going to be about rotations. Yep. It may, to Rod's point, it may even be situational um, beyond that, right? Where uh, you know mm -hmm. that in past situations, it may definitely be Burke and uh, Burke and Moore, or you bring in a Colin Simmons too, right? Yep. I mean, there, there's just so many different iterations and don't forget about Justice Finkley. Uh, he had a good, a quietly, a good end of the year yeah. last year. Uh, so he's coming on and wants to be in that rotation. Jamon Tapp, uh, part of that as well. All right. So I think that rotation, the top three, four are kind of set. If you add Finkley to that to total, what about on the interior, Rod, or, or CJ? Uh, I asked Rod first on the edge. I'll ask you now on the interior. Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins are your clear one and two out of the gate. Is that is that the way you see it ending up uh, at the end of spring? 
It is. And it's where does, like, how does Vernon Broughton take over that nose? If that's, if those are going to be your one, two, we've talked about the length of Alfred Collins, arms doesn't necessarily suit well to that true nose. If it's Vernon Broughton, he's, you know, a, a little bit of that same similar build in the sense that he doesn't have that short, stocky, immovable object build. And so if those are your two pieces, I think Texas is going to be happy in the in the passing game, but the run game is a little bit, you know, a little bit of a question mark. I think Alfred Collins' activity is very high, but as a result, he gets out of position a little bit too often in running in the running game. He's not uh, always what you would call gap sound or, or responsible to where he's supposed to be as a result of being as athletic as he is. He gets moved out of place just a little bit too much. He, in a way, he works against himself, but those are the two guys that I have right now, Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins in the interior. I think Aaron Bryant's going to uh, pick a, a role out, obviously, Savea. But if, if Sadir Mitchell can really take that step, and that's a lot to ask right now, he might be looking at uh, as that next nose, and Texas could be a little bit you know, well-positioned uh, going into next season. Uh, Rod, what do you think about this? It's 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 got to be Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton as your two front line guys. I mean, it goes without saying. I agree with CJ. Um, situationally, you might have some issues well, against run heavy, power run teams if that is going to be the case. Um, which means you and it, we're talking about this. I think for the entire defense, right? You better have a counter. You just brought up the situational kind of rotations, matchup based rotations you might have on the edges. If you're going up against a pass heavy team or you're in a pass heavy situation that you're going to play, you know, Ethan Berg and then probably, you know, I would trade more out there because those guys are your better pass rushers um, and, you know, Baron Sorrell and maybe some of the guys are better run stuffers. I, I think you could be like the same thing in the interior. It, I agree with CJ on that. Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins. Ideally, those are your two frontline guys. You need to be versatile enough to have somebody that can play the nose for you when a team counters with the power run game, which they will. Because Texas will be built, I think, constructed really well from the outside in this time. The back seven, the front seven, team, some teams, Michigan early on, they will challenge you with the power run game. Yep. Hey, I, I, I've got a note here. Aaron Bryant actually is the most natural nose that's actually older of this group. But he's also the smallest nose uh, of that group, right? Uh, because you, you, have, uh, you have also behind him Sadir Mitchell and then Alex January right, that are those bigger, real bulky-sized guys. And then don't forget about Tio Alea Savea. I think he's more of a three technique. So he's an outside guy. I, I look at all this, and I think that y'all are right. Obviously, it's Broughton and, and Collins, but I, I think that the, the future of this defensive line has to be one of Sadir Mitchell or Alex January. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I would say. Because I'm worried about how young those guys both are. Not how talented they are, but how young they are. And Mitchell is a guy that is just barely getting ready and getting going right now. January is a little bit more advanced, even though he's younger. In wow. my opinion. And so I'm concerned about, about that role, as I've been, but that's, that's okay. There's time to figure out what's going on. One of the best things about spring football and getting a guy like Alex January in early is to see exactly how ready he might be. And I, yeah. and I said this earlier, the one good thing about this too, Rod and CJ is they're going to be going up a good against a good offensive line. Texas should get a good gauge of where its defensive tackles are now. Yeah. Cause they're going to have a good, like before, if the defense was kicking butt, Texas didn't know really if it was because their offensive line was bad or the defensive line was good. Mm -hmm. Now we have a true, barometer from from which the to gauge the defensive front that's that's yeah. my opinion. so it, it, interesting uh linebackers is a little bit different scenario guys mm -hmm. I, I really think this is the, this is really difficult uh because obviously we know anthony hill is going to start and play a lot we we yeah. hope because he just is he's around the ball he smells it he feels it and then he attacks it right yeah <laughs> and he does it with him. with vigor um is the best way to put it the second one I kind of assume is David Benda, as of what we know right now. My question to y'all, though, is who plays which position? Like, do you move? Do you move Hill straight up, Mike linebacker? I mean, is, is he a Sam? How do you do that? CJ, I'm going to let you start with your thoughts on that matter. I, I think you keep Anthony Hill at will. 
I, I do. I think you use his versatility uh, and athleticism to kind of be creative in how you use him. You know, we saw it under Pete Kwiatkowski when he had DeMarvion on Overshone. He met with Dan Quinn about Micah Parsons and said, how do you, you know, how do you use this guy in your, in your defense? You know, what are the creative ways to free him up? And I think you look at Anthony Hill right now as a continual guy on your defense to say, yeah, he's going to be a game changer. I can't keep him in one spot on my defense. I have to change the looks in which I give to a, a, a def- or an opposing offense from a snap to snap basis. So I think for at least the Mike position, that's someone that, you know, we saw Jalen Ford line up in the middle of the Texas defense for mm-hmm. every single snap seemingly for two straight years. We knew where he was going to be. You didn't necessarily know where DeMarvion Overshone was going to be or in Anthony Hill last year. And that's the versatility that I think Texas should keep with Hill at will. So I'm going to go with Benda as well to kind of move into that Mike spot. Uh, but I also wonder, and I know that Benda's going to have, you know, the the elder statesman card here, but we saw Benda start the year last year as, you know, linebacker two right next to Ford. And then we saw – Anthony Hill start chipping away as the, the season progressed. And finally, it was Anthony Hill's role. I wonder how much uh, Leonga LaFowle is able to chip away at that job. He's someone that came into camp last year at 6'1", about 225. It not necessarily talked about a whole lot, but that's a very good build, and he moves very well. The tape didn't lie from high school. He can move very well, and at that size, that's adequate enough to play. Right now, if he's able to take a step, I think he carves out a pretty significant role for 23, but or 24, excuse me. But right now I have to go with Bendat Mike, Anthony Hill at will. Hey, I got to say this. Kendrick Blackshire was back up middle linebacker too at Alabama. Yeah. So, I mean, think about that. Uh, yeah. Other guys we're not talking about here too. Darian Gallette, uh, a possibility. We've heard he's having a good, good year right now. Uh, Maurice Blackwell, though, is a name that you like to mention, Rod. But you think he's more of a specialty guy in certain situations? Yeah, I mean, I would almost look at the linebacking core because of Anthony Hill's versatility that CJ uh, just mentioned. And I agree with you. You want him to be your movable chess piece. You would like, I mean, as Sark even said last year, he was one of your two best pass rushers. The guy what was a freshman walking in as one of your two best pass rushers. You don't want to lose that. That's something he has naturally. So you want to better use that off the edge. And he is electric off the edge. He really is. Got a great first step. Um, so, yeah, I would continue to move around, but depending on the team you're playing, if you're playing a team that likes to run the football or you're playing a team that decides to be a change it up as a, a power run team, then I do think Bender's the guy, and then you can move him around. You put Bender at the mic. But if you're playing a team that wants to throw the football, Bender's a, Bender's a liability in pass coverage. I, he just is, unless he's blitzing. Um, so I do wonder if you if guys like Mo Blackwell or LaFowle are better options against teams that are a little bit more balanced or teams that want to be pass pass heavier against Texas because and the truth is a lot of the a lot of your busts in coverage early on last year were crossing routes the bender. Yeah. He's, he's, so he can be more coverage sound. He can get better, but you they there are teams that are gonna go after him in pass coverage if that's your guy in the middle. Yeah, well, I, hope, I, yeah I agree. I it, you're not you're obviously right, Rod. The the, the issue is that we hope Ben is learning. Right. Yes. And this is one of those things he's got. He finally got a lot of snaps last year. Right. And so the, it could be a learning process for him overall. Uh, fingers crossed on that. But I, I think we'll go Hill and Benda at linebacker as the prediction. The secondary, man, this is going to be interesting because I, I, I feel like the corners are kind of locked in. I feel like it's going to be Terrence Brooks and Manny Muhammad. Let's start there. What do you all think? Yep, I'm with you. It's where you play either of them. I, Rod, you mentioned it on Friday that you liked Manny Muhammad at the boundary spot, and I agree with you. I think that's where I would play Manny Muhammad because he's closer to the football there. I think yep. that's a, a, a clear strength of his compared to Terrence Brooks. And I think with Terrence Brooks, though not necessarily bringing that elite speed to that wide side of the field, he was Texas's best cornerback this year. He, you know, was com- targeted. Uh, pretty often over 80 times this year, had a 44% completion percentage against. So by percentages, he was Texas's best cornerback this year, even with not necessarily having that elite speed on the wide side of the field. I'm comfortable with that in 24 because I still think Terrence Brooks has that elite athleticism despite not having that top end speed. There's a difference there because he can jump through the roof. You know, you watch him in person kind of move around laterally 
you think you're like, yeah, this guy looks like he can long jump and high jump with the best of anybody. That's the athleticism part of it. And so I'm comfortable enough with that. And I like what Malik Muhammad is able to do coming downhill to fit those quick uh, kind of, mm-hmm. you know, boundary screens or boundary, you know, toss sweeps, whatever, you know, teams like to do very quickly to get to the boundary. That's where Malik Muhammad in my eyes can come in and say, no, 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 no. I'm a physical cornerback and I like to hit people. That's rare, but he possesses it. So I like where those guys are currently. I don't know how y'all see it, but I, I think, Rod, you might be lining up with me. I, I want to hear it. Yeah, no, no. Hit the nail on the head because I, I think Malik Muhammad at that boundary where the ball is going to be coming out quicker. Uh, usually, I mean, quarterback's more accurate to the boundary. A lot of times, easier throw. I want Malik Muhammad over there. I think he's better in press. And I think they want to start playing more press coverage. Toward the end of the season, last two, well, last two regular season games, I include the Big 12 title in that. So Tech and Oklahoma State. Um, Texas played more press coverage on the field and boundary side, and they played all season long. I don't think that was coincidence. Could have been based on the matchup. They, maybe they didn't fear the wide receivers for Oklahoma State or Texas Tech. But I think that's what they want to start doing more and more of. And I think Madden Muhammad has better press technique for those easier, hyper, higher percentage throws for a quarterback on the boundary side. But the footwork of Terrence Brooks also helps him. He doesn't have the foot speed, but he's got great footwork all right, as a DB. And I think if he cleans up his leverage, I think a lot of times he gets himself in trouble with bad leverage. Like yeah. the, field, the field, leverage is key. When you're on the field side, guys, it's key. And depending on where that wide receiver is lining up, you can use the, the sideline as your other man. Um, I think sometimes he gets himself in trouble with leverage, and I don't think he has as uh, – as I don't know if the technique at the line of scrimmage is as – you know, as natural as a guy like uh, Malik Muhammad, he's a lot more physical getting his hands on guys. Sometimes Terrence Brooks doesn't reroute the wide receivers. I think he cleans all that up, but I think on the, on the field side, I trust him because sometimes they want those guys to play off coverage on the field side because uh, at times the uh, the boundary side can be end up isolated in a, in a man coverage set or they're rolling coverage to the field side where there's more space. And he can, he triangulates a little uh, really well. And what I mean by triangulate, I mean, go uh, your vision, reading the quarterback, reading from the quarterback to your number two receiver, and then they triangulate that and, and see the route combination as it happens. Essentially, that's what you're doing in zone coverage a lot of times. You're not you're going from one key to another, going from the quarterback, three-step read, boom, to number two receiver, boom, back to number one receiver. He does that really well. Um, and that's part of him being a technician. And I think that's what that's what helps him on the on the field side. I'm not sure just because of experience that Manny Muhammad does that as well. I think Terrence Brooks is a little bit better when he comes off coverage that way. He's got good eyes. Terrence Brooks yeah. has good eyes. That, that's yeah. basically what you're saying. And he lets it lead his feet a little bit. And, and yes. yeah. Um, all right. I, uh, interestingly, other than Gavin Holmes, nobody has much experience as backup there. Warren Roberson. Then you have the incoming guys like Kobe Black. We'll see if Wardell Mack plays there at all. Uh, just keep an mm. eye not only on the starters. I think the starters are in stone almost. Uh, or etched in stone, but let, let's see what the backups look like too. All right, nickel is interesting to me because here we have uh, Jade Barron, who's a returning two-year starter, going to be a three-year starter uh, for the Longhorns. But we have Andrew Bakuba coming in, Austin Jordan, Jalen Gilbo also at the position. Um, you got to think Barron is going to play nickel and push Makuba to safety. Anybody disagree with that? That's how I see no. it. I, I think Barron is penciled in. Uh, you, you mentioned not having a whole lot of depth out at cornerback. That's also been kind of uh, thrown around as well this offseason that he might be a fit out for the outside spots as well. If that happens, I would expect to see Makuba tossed down in that spot. You could talk about Jalen Gilbo also playing a little bit there. I like Jade Barron close to the football. I think he's impactful near the line of scrimmage where he's close to the football. It just feels like it's a natural playmaking instinct that he possesses more so than some of the other defensive backs on this roster. It feels like the more that he is able to be around the football, the better things happen. You look at the Houston game specifically, I would keep him at the the nickel spot and just say, Hey, like you're a good football player. We need you here more so than where, you know, I I would say you would like to play in terms of projecting towards the NFL. Unfortunately. What do you think, Rod? You think just go with Jade Barron and call it a day? Yeah, J- Jade's the guy, no question about it. He's a great football as a football investigator, as I like to call him. He's always picking up clues uh that the offense has given him. And he and that's why he's 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 so uh you know quick and decisive uh, in his action. I'll say this the only thing I'll say is if let's just say if there's um 
is this an injury? I'm knocking on wood here because I hope there's no injury at all. Um, but I wonder, like, is your your if you got an injury to your cornerback position, and let's say one of your corners ends up getting injured, Terrence Brooks or Malik Muhammad, like I said, I'm knocking on double the wood there because I'm just talking hypotheticals. I, I think it'd be better to put Jade Barron out there and, like you said, to move Makuba down than to go to one of the other backup corners. Now, maybe I'm wrong. But I'm all about putting your best five out there. Who are my best five DBs? That's why I like cross training guys. So ultimately, see, Jay Barron is probably your second or third best corner, right? And he's the guy that's going to go out there if there's an injury. Who's your second best nickel? Is it Gilbo? Is it Jordan? No, it's Makuba. <laughs> you know that, right? We all know that. So I, I that's why I'm all about cross training guys, man. I think you have to cross train guys because you never know when something happens, injury, you manufacture depth that way. Like I said, but you just mentioned the U of H game, right? Jaday Barron comes off the bench. He's not even playing, and he has to go save the game for Texas. And that was a great game, but they, they played one. I forgot the game where he has to go out to play corner um, for him as well. You know, those if not for his versatility, you know, you know, you end up losing some games next year potentially. I, I, I like having my corners and my nickels being able to play multiple positions. I think that's important. Got it. All right, I think I think the nickel spot is barren to your point, Rod, and that moves Makuba to safety. So I'm going to yep. go back to you at safety. Is there a definite starter right now? Because Makuba has been a three year starter at, at Clemson. Michael Taft started for some for Texas, and then Derek Williams looked like a little bit of a revelation for Texas at times at safety last year. There's only two spots. You got to pick two of those three. Who are you picking, Rod? Yeah, I know. No disrespect to Taft Daddy because I'm a fan, and Taft Daddy will play. Then we got to remember they rotating guys on defense, heavy rotations. Uh, uh, and actually, we criticized some some of those rotations last year. Uh, but Derek Williams can guys. He can he can cover. He's your best coverage safety. And then Makuba comes in. He can cover your two big your biggest issue in the secondary last year was foot speed and your safeties couldn't cover. They just weren't coverage specialists. They were good football players, but not coverage specialists. These guys, both of them, Derek Williams can cover, so can Makuba. I think those two guys are your safeties. And, oh, man, you're going to be a lot of guys. You're going to lock teams down in the slot there with Makuba and Derek Williams. That's going to be pretty freaking sweet. I'm going to tell you right now, that's going <laughs> to uh, – PK is licking his chops about safeties that can cover like that. Oh, man. It, is, it gives you so much freedom and flexibility as a, as a play caller. Also yeah. has some newcomers coming in, too. Jelani McDonald moved there to, to safety full-time. Uh, Xavier Filsamy is there. We think Thank Jordan you. Johnson Rebell will play a little bit of nickel, a little bit of safety. Wardell Mack, uh, maybe as well. Uh, CJ, you have any comments about that safety room that you want to add? I think if you're rolling out Derek Williams with Andrew Makuba and having Malik Muhammad and Terrence Brooks and Jade Barron up at the nickel spot, you're looking at a defensive secondary that can really range in terms of what they can cover in the passing game. And, and for my money's worth, those are – all surefire tackling guys too. You know, Derek, Derek Williams showed that he's willing to tackle. We've talked about Manny Muhammad. Terrence Brooks is, you know, an athletic guy. Andrew Makuba was an all-American guy as a freshman at Clemson, and that's kind of stuck around. He's been more towards the box where you have to be a physical guy. So mm -hmm. I think the traits that you see with Jade and Makuba, you know, those are physical traits that you have playing in space, whereas it's not – common for them to want to get their hands dirty and, and get a, a big hit on somebody. So not only are you increasing your uh, ability to cover the, the whole the whole field because of an athletic standpoint, but you're also getting five guys on the field in the secondary that are willing to tackle, which hasn't always been the case with the Texas, Texas secondary over the years. So I love this defensive secondary on paper. We'll see how it goes against this mm. new talented wide receiving core in, uh, in spring football. But right now on paper, I love this. This is yeah. uh, this is fun. Yeah. You think so? In whole, we've went, we've gone through all the defensive positions. Y'all think that the back five is the potential strength of the defense this coming year? I think so. I think that uh, you're returning two two starting cornerbacks. Your, your nickel is there. You have you know a, a freshman or returning freshman that showed a lot of good promise. You know we thought that he should have been on the field more than he sh he was at times last year. And obviously Makuba, a three year starter at Clemson you're looking around saying, all right, they have the athleticism. They have experience everywhere now. This should be a much improved secondary than what we saw a year ago because of the speed, because of the versatility, and because of the, you know, just pure ability to, to play football. Rod, you yeah. think the defensive secondary is, is the team's strength? Yeah, and it'll be 
it's yes, I I do believe it's a strength uh, because you're obviously returning Jade Bear and experience, and you're bringing in Makuba. But I will say this: I think also what's going to help just the coverage overall. The coverage will be better. So a lot of that pressure. Remember, Texas last two years, guys have been like top five in the Power Five and pressure, top ten, I should say, in the Power Five and pressures. They've been getting a lot of pressures, but they don't always translate into splash plays. They don't translate into takeaways all the time. And Texas is trying to really figure out what's how to bridge that disconnect, right? How do we turn this pressure into more splash plays with a guy like, you know, Trey Moore now on the edge, which are edge rushers just being better overall, Ethan Berg, Baron Sorrell, you know, bringing in a guy like Colin Simmons, you know, Anthony Hill can rush off the edge too. You might get more effective pressure and your coverage is going to be a little stickier. So I wouldn't doubt if overall, yes, your secondary ends up being better, but it's more of a, group effort it's more of a, a philosophical change that that's why the coverage is better because you're getting more pressure on, you're getting pressure on the quarterbacks that's translating into splashier plays but it, i think it'll be it, it's all i think going to be a, a kind of a group effort but i do think the secondary is going to end up coverage may end up being the strength whereas rush defense was your strength last year as a unit fair enough fair enough all right that's going to do it uh, for the defensive is, is, issue of this uh, or episode, I guess I should say, of On Texas Football. Uh, I liked it. Uh, not many surprises in there uh, to me, uh, really, to say that. I think we were most concerned, most uh, uh, questioning ourselves at edge as yeah. who, who would be going there with Sorrell, Moore, and Burke, and also maybe a little bit at safety. Maybe a little bit at safety. All right. Uh, and in linebacker, too, I guess. Yeah. All right. For Rod Babers and CJ Vogel, I'm Bobby Burton. That's been this episode of On Texas Football. Hope everybody's having a good weekend. Hook them. Hook them.